Thank you for joining us for today's National Library of Medicine History Talk. This annual series of programs is designed to promote awareness and use of NLM and related historical collections for research, education, and public services, public service in biomedicine, the social sciences, and the humanities. NLM History Talks also support the commitment of the National Library of Medicine to recognize the diversity of its collections, which span 10 centuries, encompass a range of digital and physical formats, and originate from nearly every part of the globe. Moreover, NLM History Talks foreground the voices of people of color, women, and individuals of a variety of cultural and disciplinary backgrounds who value these collections and use them to advance their research, their teaching, and their learning. So welcome, everyone. For those of you on Twitter, thank you for following along using the hashtag NLMHistTalk. And for those of you who wish to share questions with our speaker this afternoon, please use the live feedback button under the video stream, and those questions will come to me and I'll share them with our speaker. So today, I have the great privilege of introducing Dr. Randall Sell, professor at Drexel University School of Public Health in the Department of Community Health and Prevention. Dr. Sell is the author or co-author of dozens of scholarly articles which critically examine demographic variables. This work originated in his research on defining and measuring sexual orientations and sampling sexual minorities for public health research. He joins us today to talk about a dimension of his research, which took him to the archival collections of the National Library of Medicine. The title of his talk, We're Here, We're Queer, Get Used to It, Struggles and Stories to be Heard for Today and Tomorrow. Dr. Sell, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Dr. Resnick, uh, for the introduction. Before I begin, I wish I could see everyone because I want to ask who recognizes this picture. I hope someone in some room somewhere watching this is raising their hand because I think it's an important picture taken at an important moment. Uh, a hint is that it happened at an American Library Association uh, conference in 1971, and I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to it a little bit later. So Dr. Resnick mentioned that much of my work critically examines demographic variables. This is because I'm interested in how knowledge is constructed and the consequences of this construction process, which in science we call research methods, on what is constructed and ultimately what we know. What we know and how we get to know it, which seems to be random, but is almost entirely non-random or vice versa, is of interest because it simultaneously supports and threatens the existence of queer people. For queer folk, understanding the processes involved in knowledge construction is consequently essential. I've come to understand that when you can't take something for granted, such as marriage or employment or housing or parental rights or publishing or simply being represented on a library shelf, you think about it more critically. Exploring the role of libraries in the knowledge construction process is the focus of this talk. So some quick background about me. You know, I came out pre-age. I came out somewhat in high school. I started college in 1982 at the dawn of the AIDS epidemic. Uh, and was so I was out in college. I started the gay grad group at the University of Pennsylvania, organized the first uh, uh, AIDS awareness week, probably at a, almost any university in the, in the country. And then for my first job in 1980, 1988, I started working at the Project Hope Center for Health Affairs uh, in Washington, D.C., where I began working on numerous projects examining the health of gay men in relationship to AIDS on some of the first government-funded AIDS studies. One of these projects was the Project Hope International AIDS Survey. This led me to understand the importance of data invisibility and how the impact and how that impacts programs and funding, which leads me, which led me to, in 1989, first asking the National Health Interview Survey to collect sexual orientation data. So I went to the people at the National Health Interview Survey and I said, you need to add a sexual orientation variable. No one really listened to me, of course, uh, but that spurred me in 1990 to go on for my doctoral studies, where I wrote down on a piece of paper, the last thing that you'll see on this slide, Data equals power. I was stealing, of course, 
uh, from silence equals death. And I had participated in a lot of the act, act up things in the in the late 80s, as just as they began. But you can generalize this data equals power to information equals power. So I began examining, so as I was doing this, I began examining how research is, research, researchers historically studied and consequently constructed knowledge about gay men, which led me to spend a lot of time in libraries and at the time when there was used bookstores, used bookstores all over uh, Boston and any city that I visited. In 1991, I came across uh, one of the books that intrigued me most, which was Earl Lind's, uh, the author of that book was Earl Lind, also known as Ralph Werther, Jenny June, their autobiography of an androgyne, uh, which I'll come back to in a bit. I want to show everyone because I have it here, but I won't hold it up. Uh, but what I want to do today is talk about how do gay materials get into libraries. And by gay, I'm using the word gay here because when people started working on this, the Gay Task Force for Liberation, which I'll be talking about, uh, that was founded in 1971, they used the word gay and they talked about gay materials. Today we might change that and use the word queer, but I'm talking about any sexual or gender minorities or lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, plus that, uh, that you want to imagine. How do these materials get into libraries? Well, there's various barriers to getting into the libraries. First, they have to get produced. One of the things that I've focused on a lot is, is written. Why? Like, particularly with these early people, what, what motivates you? What's this internal motivation that makes you uh, want to write something? And on my last slide, I'll give a hint as to what I think some of this, some of the reasons why might be on the very, very last slide. But if you write something, how do you get published? Uh, early folks, you know, getting a book contract. Um, and then distribution. In the early days, it was often person, uh, books would be books or manuscripts or anything written or published or mimeographed was distributed person to person, let alone uh, through bookstores or libraries. But how is it acquired? Those of you that work in libraries know that these things aren't free. And if you've been paying attention to anything happening in the world today, you know, there's also a social and political uh, uh, cost to acquiring these documents, but also some of the things that maybe the general public doesn't think of, how are these documents uh, classified? Uh, and I wanna talk about the importance of that, the subject headings, how they get, like how they get labeled and, you know, for searching. And that then relates to how they get shelved and where they get shelved and what they get put next to. But also then once they're in a library, how are they retained? They're defaced, stolen. I have a couple of good stories about stealing. Uh, uh, that I hope to get to or banned. So Jennifer Terry in her book on, uh, titled An American Obsession states that for much of the late 19th and 20th centuries, writing about sexuality in any manner other than strictly prescribing, it was discouraged in the United States. Authors met with publishers' refusals, censorship, public criticism, and even persecution on obscenity charges, thus limiting who could speak. Today I'm going to touch on some or all of the things on uh, this uh, slide using examples of three people, uh, two of which have documents that are in the National Library of Medicine. The first, Earl Lynn, Ralph Werther, Jenny June went by many names. Today I'm going to use the word Werther and mostly use male pronouns and I know at other times in other presentations, I'll use female pronouns or they pronouns and different names. But here, because of the documents that are in the National Library of Medicine, the Werther is used and Werther actually writes and uses male pronouns about himself. But, um, but I'm going to tell the story from that previous slide using Werther and the document, The Riddle of the Underworld in the National Library of Medicine collection, Alan Bernstein and his document in the collection titled Millions of Queers Are Homo America, one of my favorite titled books or manuscripts. Uh, but I'm adding to the two of those Barbara Giddings, who somewhat is a stand-in for the American Library Association Task Force on Gay Liberation, um, and some of the stuff that she uh, wrote and worked on. But first, I want to quickly give an example of how powerful 
a single book in a library can be. Why is it important to have a book in a, li a library? And how much impact can a single book have? So how about I was with John Addington Simons published Sexual Inversion in Germany in 1896 and in English in 1897 with many later editions. For those of you that don't know, Sexual Inversion uh, today I'm going to equate with homosexuality uh, and is, is often equated with homosexuality. Ellis's book didn't get published easily. Ellis had to fight to get the book published. Ellis worked with Simons, who most historians say was a closeted homosexual. He was closeted maybe to some people, but was very, very out to a lot of people. So here I'll say a semi, um, Simons was semi-closeted. Ellis was unable to find a publisher in England because, pub because publishers feared prosecution. Therefore, it was first published in Germany. Later, an, an American company published the English book. However, the book was suppressed by British authorities who even charged the bookseller for selling it. And the bookseller just pleaded guilty rather than fight the charges. Simon's family, Simon's died around this time. Simon's fa family tried to suppress the book mostly to protect themselves. Simons wanted it to be published, but the book got published. And uh, Werther cites Ellis, so going back to the examples, Werther cites Ellis numerous times uh, in his works. Uh, first, here's a quote. I availed myself to the library of the New York Academy of Medicine. This would have been a, in the 1890s. Some years later, I read there Havelock Ellis's sexual inversion, and until 30 years ago, American and British public opinion would not tolerate the publication of the facts about androgynism, even for circulation among the medical profession. Havelock Ellis's sexual inversion, the earliest published book in English language on androgynism, was promptly suppressed by the British government. And I go through the, that and repeat all the stuff about the suppression, because that's Werther talking about it. Werther knew that of the troubles of the publication and the suppression of it. Bernstein also cites Ellis numerous times, particularly, here's just one quick quote, today the standard treatises saying these are the standards, and this is in the 1930s, are Ellis, Ellis's, Freud's, and Kraft Ebbing, which are all about a half century old at the time. And Giddings states, in a recording, a great recording with her, with uh, Eric Marcus, um, the Making Gay History podcasts, just Google Making Gay History, Barbara Giddings, Eric Marcus, and you'll find a great recording. She states, the closest I got to some sense of gay people with personalities and real lives was in Havelock Ellis's book. Of all things, it was full of good stuff because you could find something to identify with in most of the people Ellis has wrote about, even if they sounded very peculiar. So let me discuss getting uh, stuff into gay materials into libraries, as I said on the previous slide, first starting with Werther. I came to Werther, as I said, because of the uh, autobiography of an androgyne, and was particularly interested in this survey instrument, which folds out, is in the back of the book, and folds out, and it's a questionnaire on homosexuality, and I was doing questionnaires related to this. So uh, I, I looked for this second uh, book in the in the series. The book book first book is Autobiography of an Androgyne. The second book is The Female Impersonators, and I thought it would have the results of this survey. I found that it didn't. So I thought, ah, the results must be in the third book that they talk about that where they talks about the riddle of the underworld, uh, where were there. Uh, describes um, various things that I thought might all, also include this. So um, let me just, along the way I encountered lots of, surf, so I started looking for the riddle of the underworld, and along the way I encountered lots of sources simply stating it was never published, but only because they couldn't find a copy. Historians would say it's never published, and I'm like, it has to have been published, or there has to be a copy of it somewhere. So uh, I couldn't find a copy but it was hard to believe it wasn't. And you can see here uh, in what were their second book, they even specified the word length and illustration 
count in the book. In other places, Werther uses the past tense describing the book, saying it has been elaborated simultaneously with the female impersonators and talks about specific chapters and actually then talks about how they're writing, they're currently writing their fourth book called Susa, which of course would like to know where that is. So where is Riddle? I often imagined that maybe a house fire or something happened. Uh, as I was writing my dissertation, I thought uh, something, how, the house will burn down and I'll lose everything. And, and that could be what happened. But one day while searching the internet to find some information about Victor Robinson, I found an online description talking about his archives and said the archives are in the National Library of Medicine. And I don't know why, but I went and thought, let's see what I can find online about Victor Robinson's archives. And looking, I started looking through the boxes in the collection and between two books, between in, in box five, between The Price of Prudery, which I love that title, and the, the History of Aviation Medicine was The Riddle of the Underworld, which I, I was quite shocked. I thought this couldn't, couldn't be. However, um, uh, you know, so I requested it, but it was. And, uh, you know, upon request, I found that there were several chapters, not the whole book, in the collection, and it included a book contract between Werther and, and Robinson. And it had been lying largely unnoticed, uh, not entirely, but largely unnoticed in the, uh, the collection of the National Library of Medicine. I still don't know why it, it wasn't published, but there's lots of documentation that gives us evidence to think about why it might not. And so what I want to do is, once again, discuss some of the difficulties with publishing and use these people, Bell, Schufeld, Herzog, Robinson, and Comstock, as, as examples. So while we don't know why the riddle of the underworld wasn't published for sure, uh, we do know a lot about his struggles. The first book was probably finished around 1900 and wasn't published till 1918. Werther states, I myself had to bend the knee for 18 years to medical publishers before my autobiography was fed into the printing press, 18 years. Werther further states, I worked seven hours a day. This is for Bell, uh, Clark Bell. I work seven days a week for a legal journal as Earl Lind, because under my, under that name, I had called upon its editor, which we, um, to persuade him to publish my autobiography. So he, he went to Bell and actually ended up getting a job. Didn't get his book published, but he, he got a, got a job, uh, working with Bell and showed it to Bell. Bell, uh, didn't publish it. As Earl Lind, he also approached Schudfeld. This picture here, it was taken by Schutfeld. I think my guess is Werther approached Schutfeld because Werther actually liked being photographed, liked being photographed, posing as classical statues. You'll see classical statues in the back, and in the book, the photo credit is is Schutfeld. So I'd been looking for a connection between Schutfeld and, and Werther, and I found Wer Schutfeld actually writes about meeting uh, Werther in a 1905 article titled. And so this is the title of the article, The Medical Legal Consideration of Perverts and Inverts. So in this article on perverts and in inverts, Schutfeld uh, uh, thought Werther had committed suicide because the person came to him as Earl Lind and said Werther committed suicide, but here's what he wrote. So Schutfeld says that when Lind approached him, uh, he told me that, he pointedly that it had been pointedly declined to undertake the venture publishers had, giving various excuses for doing so. Nearly every one of them, however, who read it laid a special stress upon the danger attached to the publication and sale of the work uh, of that character. That is, the danger arising from what the law might think of it and the action the courts might take. So in 1905, Schutfeld saying, this is dangerous, etc. Herzog, who's the person that eventually published it, when they did publish it, begins, talks about the difficulty that 
where they're had in numerous places. That also at the introduction says, I offer no apology for bringing, and it shows how enthusiastic they were about publishing. It starts with the very first words, I offer no apology for bringing the autobiography of an androgyne before the members of the Warren professions to whom its sale is restricted. And then publishes the second book and says that uh, they're doing that only because the, the 10 publishers turned turn that down uh, for publication. Uh, but also, um, I'll skip through some of the, but I, two more quick ones. Robinson, in the contract between Werther and Robinson, uh, which I think Werther probably wrote. So Werther, you know, who had written The Riddle of the Underworld, Autobiography of an Androgyne, has written these books, gives this contract to her, to, to Robinson, and the contract says, uh, uh, the Riddle of the Underworld, uh, uh, let, let's see where it starts, is to be published without the omission or change of a word or a mark of punctuation or a capitalization. So that's why I think that part was written by Werther. It's so strict. It says, accepting that anything that Dr. Robinson would admit solely on the grounds that it would be, uh, would be, would conflict with the law against obscene publication. So there they're saying, you know, you may not publish something because it could be found obscene, and I'll let you change it for that. Finally, were there documented an interaction with Anthony Comstock? Uh, and so hopefully everyone here today knows who Anthony Comstock is. Uh, if not, please Google it and search. Uh, uh, Comstock is still in the, in the news today. And uh, Comstock actually credited himself with driving 15 people to suicide uh, uh, because of his prosecution prosecutions, but uh, Werther states that in 1900, as soon as I had this autobiography ready for publication, I submitted it to Mr. Comstock in order to ascertain whether it could be circulated. He was then a post office department inspector with the power to prosecute for shipping obscene matter. So he hands it to him. Comstock says, no, I'm going to skip a, a lot of what Comstock says, but I am going to put on the screen uh, when Werther walks out of the room with Comstock, Werther writes down what Comstock says. Uh, Comstock says, uh, these inverts are not fit to live with the rest of, of mankind. They ought to have branded in their foreheads the word unclean, and as the lepers of old, they ought to cry unclean, unclean as they go about. And instead of the law making 20 years imprisonment the penalty for their crime, it ought to be imprisonment for life. They are assaulted and black, are they, are they assaulted and blackmailed? They deserve to be. So, um, uh, and this goes on and on. Uh, I won't read any more, but you can see that's the difficulty with publishing. To just have a quick positive note, uh, were there in the document that's in, in the National Library of Medicine collection, the Riddle of the Underworld, these unpublished chapters, were there actually has this, you can see it on the screen. I thought this was, was fun, despite having interactions with people, or perhaps because of having interaction with people like Comstock says, if after my death or during my lifetime, I cannot expect to obtain attention much uh, from the reading public, man is such a biased animal, I ever attract a few hundred sympathetic readers, it would be a good joke for them to collect pennies for a bronze tablet to be affixed to the Grand Street facade of the police headquarters. And actually here you can see, they actually say, and this is what I want on my, my plaque. Uh, this is the headquarters, the headquarters still exists. If anyone wants, I am, I would love to go put a plaque on there. It's no longer a police headquarters, it's a condo, the condo association and uh, there's a condo for sale right now in it for uh, $7.5 million. So, uh, but that's enough with Werther. Werther had a lot of difficulties getting what they did publish published. Alan Bernstein had, you know, had wrote many different documents, as I said, which I found out later, but the document that's in, and just focusing for a little while on the document that's in the question of the National Library of Medicine, millions uh, uh, um, uh, the document was titled, Millions of Queers Are Homo America. 
I have two sources where Bernstein states that he sent the Millions manuscript to the Army Medical Library. The Army Medical Library is the pre precursor to the National Library of Medicine. In the spring of 1941, he uh, actually made two letters on May 26, 1943. He talks about sending it in 1941. In a letter to a fan, he actually had a fan who had read it in the library. Um, Bernstein says that the fan's letter came to him in the spring of 1941, which means it had to have been in their collection because the fan then read it and wrote uh, wrote to him. The fan, he said, learned of this document, the Millions of Queers document in the National Medical Library's collection, learned of it, and this is a quote, through congenial acquaintances working in the Army Medical Library. I love that. Congenial, conge if you're gay, you know what this means. Congenial acquaintances working in the medical Army Medical Library. This speaks to how there was an informal reference librarian thing going on at the Army Medical Library, like in many other libraries, which often kept secret bibliographies of queer materials. Further, my suspicion is that the manuscript was stolen. Uh, as you'll see, it was also Bernstein's suspicion that the version he sent in 1941 was stolen. In 1991, Bernstein wrote to a friend saying, of course, the one copy I gave to the then Army Medical Library quickly vanished via interested reader, and Bernstein puts interested reader in quotes. In Bernstein's 1943 letter to the American Medical Library, he was asking for the reference number for the manuscript so he could use it to try to get into army courses. He was in the army, he wanted to get into certain courses, and he wanted to show, look, I wrote this great document. So he needed the reference number to give to his superiors, uh, which to me is a, a whole a whole nother story. He was using his uh, actual address in the in the army while he was doing this. So uh, the Army Medical Library responded responded that they didn't have it. They were like, we don't have it. We don't know where it went. Uh, and but they said we would like to see a copy. So he sent a copy, and after some back and forth, uh, he got this letter from the Army Medical Library from um, uh, L. K. Fogg. So. Uh, let me just read just a little bit of this. Uh, Falk, in 1944, after getting this second copy, says, I'm naturally disturbed to learn that you not only sent a previous copy to the library, but received an acknowledgement on our postcard form. In view of the fact that the item entirely escaped my attention, I expect to investigate the misappropriation insofar as I am able. But at this stage, can only venture only venture a guess as to what happened. The manuscript strikes me as the sort of thing that we should find a place for in the collection, quite regardless of the possibility for of immediate use. So didn't necessarily see immediate use, but knew maybe in the future, someone like me would find future use. So that's the great thing about, about archives. Uh, so what strikes me most uh, with this document is that Alan's uh, use of his real name, which was unheard of at the time, while he did use pseudonyms elsewhere, most frequently John McPherson, he didn't do so when sending a document titled Millions of Queers Are Homo America to the Army Medical Library from his address in the Army. Uh, that takes some nerve. There's a detailed description on Out History. You can see I encourage people to go to Out History to learn about Alan, Alan Bernstein, uh, uh, where you, uh, but it took me four years uh, after getting the manuscript to find out that there really was someone really named Alan Bernstein who had written a bunch of uh, other things. And uh, you can see how I, I made the connection. I actually found the title Millions of Queers Are Home America in a, uh, a book that the Surgeon General's Office put out of their new acquisitions every year. And in 1945, they put out the acquisitions for 44, and it's listed there. I saw that title and thought, oh, it's gotta be something terrible about gay people, but it actually turned out to be this and positive. The document is one of the earliest known defenses of homosexuality in English. With an earlier, much shorter defense, he wrote, that I found once I contacted his family, they had all these, these other materials. Uh, that another that he was trying to publish in 1938, provocatively, provocatively titled, A Pervert Talks Back. Bernstein fought for gay rights until his death 
at age 95 in 2008. This court included organizing activities. He claimed to have been an early member of Mattachine. Gay, he worked on gays in the military, uh, uh, blood donations when gays were uh, not allowed to donate blood, and even same-sex marriage after the year 2000. I like to say he was the fourth Gump of gay rights. He was there for so many important things in 20th century. Uh, and once again, on Out History, you can read about stuff like his 37-year successful fight to have his dishonorable discharge uh, made honorable. But to move on to my last example, Barbara Giddings, I hope some of you recognize this picture when I put it up earlier. It was taken by Gidding, Giddings' partner, Kay Tobin uh, Lahuzen. Uh, the woman on the left she's kissing is Isabel Miller at the first Hug a Homosexual Booth at the American Library Association in Dallas in June 1971. So 19, this is a 1971 conference where they have a Hug a Homosexual Booth. Um, the booth was run by the American Library Association. This is a lot here. American Library Association's Social Responsibility Roundtables Task Force on Gay Liberation. Task Force on Gay Liberation. I love that. Um, later known as the, the Gay and Lesbian Task Force, which now is known as the Rain, Rainbow Roundtable, I think. The task force had been created in 1970 by Janet Cooper and uh, Israel, Fish, Israel Fishman and was the first time gay people in any professional organization had come together to advance the gay cause through, that, through their profession. ALA members were true pioneers, the first gay professional organization, at least in the United States. They were eager to change gay literature and gay people's lives, as well as openly influence library holdings. And that's a quote from them, openly influence library holdings. I include this picture because to me, it represents one of those before and after moments for lesbian and gay civil rights uh, that, you know, I hope other people start to think of in that way. And more specifically, a before and after for gay literature. And there, I mean, everything from an impact on uh, literature that was about to be produced to how this literature would be experienced by following generations in bookstores and libraries. Several days ago, I spoke with John Cunningham, who I hope is on and listening to this. Uh, he was a close friend of Barbara's and Kay's, uh, and he himself has done amazing things uh, elsewhere, but also with the ALA in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, we discussed the importance of this, of this conference. John uh, said, I'll tell you why this was important. Barbara had, had read about the task force soon after it was created, like months after it was created in 1970, and it clicked for her, a light bulb went off, because she knew it could accomplish so much based upon her experience as a youth and in college looking for books in libraries, such as the example I gave with her experience with, with Ellis that I pointed out. She knew as a non-librarian, she also knew that as a non-librarian, she didn't have to worry about losing her job or career. Uh, which I'll come, come back to. She and Kay, her partner, came up with the idea uh, for the booth to get publicity, and Barbara said about the hug a homosexual strategy. So Barbara said this about this strategy, a kissing booth at a librarian's conference, a gay kissing booth. What on earth are those people up to? And th that's probably what she was hearing from people who passed by. But the Task Force on Gay Liberation was much more than a kissing booth. Uh, and I, once again, I encourage you to listen to the, the podcast on uh, making gay history and to look them up. Barbara collected a lot of stuff. It's documented. A lot of this stuff's easy to find online. But, for example, the task force addressed all of the concerns that I included on that slide. Uh, the, the slide, which I titled, How Do Gay Materials Get Into Libraries? They didn't address all the concerns in this pamphlet, the pamphlet you see here, uh, which I stole. You'll see the, on the bottom of this, it says, How to Get Gay Materials into Libraries. I stole, I stole that title from them. Uh, uh, but they addressed all of them over, over the first decade and, and later. For example, they influenced what was produced. Barbara became an informal matchmaker between authors and publishers. They created an award which encouraged and gave legitimacy to, the, to a genre and simultaneously redefined it. 
I mean, you have to think about what awards do and the symbolism of them. So it, it, it gave legitimacy, but also redefined what it meant. Uh, they also then, when materials weren't available, they created themselves and they saw a need, uh, including a primer in 1972 titled Fun With Our Gay Friends, in which Dick and Jane and their playmates casually met same-sex adult couples as a natural part of the world around them. Uh, and John, if John Cunningham's listening, can tell you about lots of other great materials that, that they produced. The task force influenced the distribution and acquisition by supporting the creation and growth of gay and lesbian specific libraries and archives, creating bibliographies that librarians and others could use to find books. The first list in 1971 had 37 books by 1980 and had 563. They advised other organizations like P flag, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, which was then Parents of Gays. They advised uh, religious organizations, the Gay Teachers Association, and organizations lobbying lawmakers. Uh, they um, also produced pamphlets like the one shown here, and the task force influenced book classification and shelving, which I have a lot here written that I would love to talk about, but I, I, I don't have enough time, so I'm going to skip some of this, but they were concerned with how materials were classified, and this is a, is a really important issue. Getting said she had grown tired of reading about herself in categories such as sexual perversion and wondering and worrying. Amelia Crawford writes that subject description, so this is how books, when they get into a library, are classified. Crawford said, subject description is both valuable and political. Subject headings can either reinvert, reinforce or subvert hierarchies of social domination. To confront these concerns, the organization had many talks. I'll just mention one, Steve Wolf in 1971 at the 71 conference, this person where they were doing a lot of presenting, uh, gave a talk called Sex in the Single Cataloger. And in that talk states that the current library classification subject heading systems do not reflect the change in social attitudes. 15 million gay men and women in this country refuse to be called sexual aberrations. So the subject heading was often aberration, perversion, etc. And then that changed to homosexual and they fought that and said it shouldn't be homosexual, it, it should be gay. They also worked about the uh, getting books read and retained. They worked with places saying that the book shouldn't be hidden behind, that they should be equally equally available for people to get on the shelves. They gave a talk called Serving the Fearful Reader. When someone comes in and they're fearful, how do you deal with that? And this I would have loved to have seen. I don't know if it was ever, uh, if it was taped, but they did in 1976 a, a skit uh, titled, Now You See It, Now You Don't, about books getting stolen from libraries, usually by friends, gay people that wanted to have something to take home and read it at home, but were afraid to read it in the library or, or something. Once again, I'll argue that the formation of the Task Force on Gay Liberation was an important turning point whose roots can easily be seen today, for example, in such things as critical cataloging. And I want to thank my neighbor, Dylan Granger, who turned me on to critical cataloging, which I started reading a lot about as I was preparing for this, and I realized this is all the roots of this stuff, you know, I see in what they were they were doing back then. But also, I love I'm in a department of I'm in a department of community health and prevention. I love community activities. There's community. A lot of people in the community have produced a uh, uh, this uh, that you see here, the Homosaurus, which uh, allows people to rethink the classification of materials. And I don't want to take too much time on this, but a quick aside. As I said, there's an important, they had a book award. This is a picture of Isabel Miller who won the first book award, but Isabel was really typical of what was happening at the time. And you can watch what happened over the 10 years from this award to the next. But Isabel Miller, it wasn't even her, her, her real name, her, her, her birth, birth name, I should say. It was the, the name that she used for her other books that were non-queer related was Alma Root Song. She was born in 1924. She went to a lot. She went to a library in, in Traverse City, Michigan, and read The Well of Loneliness, which inspired her. She ended up going into World War II. She got married, had four 
four children, wrote several no novels, his Alma Root song, and then met a woman at church uh, and ended up leaving her husband and moving to Greenwich Village and living on Bleecker Street, which is the street I live on. And she wrote a place, a place for us using Isabel Miller, which was an anagram uh, using the words lesbian and her mother's maiden name. And I really don't have time for this, but Michael McConnell and Jack Baker, look them up. They're fascinating. They, uh, Baker was great at doing publicity, but McConnell got fired uh, at his job in 1970 for, uh, because he and his partner applied for uh, a marriage license. Uh, his employer found out he was working as a librarian. He got fired. He fought it. It's one of the first cases where someone tries uh, to sue to uh, get their job back, claiming that they were fired because they were gay. He actually goes to a, they actually go to a place, get married, and are considered the first legally married couple. And it was, their marriage was never revoked. It was 1971. So it's, it's a great, great story. But even the American Library Association didn't support him in fighting his dismissal from being fired. So, uh, so I encourage people to look that up and, and read that story. But it's hard to talk about Werther, Bernstein, or the Task Force for Gay Liberation and the important contributions they made without recognizing where we are today. Tom Stock's conversation, was, which I was hesitant to put on the screen because it's so hurtful when you read it, but Comstock's conversation with Werther still seems familiar. Here are some newspaper headlines. I said this says from the last year, but I think all of these you could you could put up this many from the last day uh, uh, titles, and, and I wasn't planning to read them, but I'm, I'm going to read two of them. Butte Silver Bow County cancels transgender speaker at a library over concerns for violating. So they canceled it because the person speaking was transgender. They were talking about transgender history, but their their concern was as much that the individual speaking uh, identified as, as two-spirit. I, I don't want to be too heavy here. I did put the last one. Hillsborough School Board votes to ban this book is gay. <laughs> um, uh, I would probably ban that too. Um, but uh, the American Library Association in a recent report found uh, book bans reached a record high in 2022 with more than 1,200 challenges. Deborah Caulfield Stone, the uh, director of the ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom, recently said, the last two years have been exhausting frightening, outrage-inducing, with over 2,500 different books objected to. So uh, we all know what's going on right now with libraries and books, but I wanted to take a moment. These, I know I've been speaking quickly, but I wanted to take a moment to put the titles up on the screen of the books that I've been talking about and let you, you think about them. Werther was trying to publish an autobiography of a transgender person, was writing a book called The Female Impersonators, which many people uh, you know, might, today might think of as drag queen. The Riddle of the Underworld. Bernstein was a pervert, talks back. Millions of queers are homo America. Giddings and uh, the people that, at, at the Gay Liberation Task Force producing fun with our gay friends, and what seems more relevant than ever, how to get gay materials into libraries when gay materials are being taken out of libraries. So as I said, two of these documents are in, you know, rare documents that are in the collection at the National Library of Medicine. So, so thankfully they exist there, and thankfully they've been uh, preserved. But today, I wanted to end on a note of optimism. And before one final thought, here's Patrick Bauman, valedictorian of Sioux City. So this is in Iowa where a number of laws have been passed recently. Uh, this is the valedictorian of Sioux City West High School's class of 1990, or, yeah, that's how old I am, class of 2023, uh, ending his commencement speech 
on May 26th. So this is less than two weeks ago. Today, I'd like to create our own story. A story of class of 2023. A shared love of our class. The story of how we made our dreams our own reality. I challenge each and every one of you today to fight for your dreams. To fight for the world you want to see. Life is what we make it, and we are going to excel. So, in final words, I would like to throw, throw the first brick into our future, break the glass ceiling, and stand up for the rights of others. I've been meaning to do this all year. Support trans rights and read banned books. Don't let us take away, don't let them take away our love. Don't let them ban the books of the people we love. And don't stop fighting, for we are the class of 2023. And no matter what they say, what they do, they cannot stop us, for they can ban this book, but they cannot take it away from us. So. I love you all. So, um, I was trying not to listen to it because I knew it would probably get me choked up. Um, I, I know I should have given a, tr a trigger warning before this entire presentation. Um, what happened to the individuals that I listed on this document, to Giddings, Werther, and Bernstein, you, everything that you need a trigger warning happened to these individuals. I didn't talk about mo most of it, uh, uh, but um, uh, I wanted to end with this. Uh, finally, through all of my research, I've always wondered that first thing, why are gay materials ever produced and available for distribution from person to person in bookstores or libraries in any way? That is, what motivates people like Werther, Bernstein, and Giddings to work tirelessly over decades against all odds? Perhaps Bernstein, and I was just listening to, there's a Library of Congress interview with him talking about him being gay in World War II. Um, in World War II. Uh, so I was re-listening to that two days ago. So perhaps uh, Bernstein, uh, for me, uh, best answered this question when offering in that recording, with a chuckle, the thought, stupid persistence. So uh, I just wanna thank John Cunningham, Dylan Granger, and all of my friends at the New York City LGBT Community Center, uh, the National History Archives, uh, for supporting me and helping me with this. So, uh, thank you. Time for questions, if there are any. Dr. Sell, thank you very much. Fantastic talk. We really appreciate you preparing it. Uh, and all of our conversations beforehand. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, several questions that have come in, uh, and I'll remind those who are watching, uh, please use the live feedback button underneath the video stream to send questions uh, that you might have for Dr. Sell, and I'll be happy to uh, share them with him. Uh, the first question, uh, thank you for sharing your experiences and your research in this wonderful talk. Is there any evidence of backlash when the Army Medical Library included millions of queers on its acquisitions list in 1943? If not, do you have any theories as to why? Uh, I don't know of any backlash. I don't know. I mean, today, the, you know, the interesting thing, if you've, if you've been doing this for a long time, you know today you can search anything online. Um, and there's been a lot of stuff, you know, like government-funded grants on gay health for a long time anytime something was published, organizations would search, they would see certain words, and and there would be a backlash. And the government, for a long time, would actually, when you were applying and submitting a grant, would tell you to use different words, words that weren't, the words that weren't being searched for. Back then, you know, I, I don't think people were searching and finding stuff as easily. And my guess is, if someone saw it, uh, millions of queers in my home. Most people that were non-gay probably wouldn't know what that meant. And if they did, they probably would have thought it was something negative, uh, which it was, you know, which was my first impression. So I don't, that, that would be my theory of why there wouldn't be any, wasn't any that I saw, although I haven't searched for that. 
Thank you. Uh, several uh, individuals have written in um, remarking how wonderful your talk was, and they thank you very much for sharing uh, it and all of the research uh, behind it. Um, can you talk a little bit about how oral histories and interviews factored into your research? You mentioned a few people that you spoke with. Can you say more about that? We have a couple, several questions that have come in about the use of oral histories and interviews. Oral histories, of course, are extremely important. Like Alan, Alan Bernstein, the like most of the ones that I talked about are ones that I didn't do. Mark, uh, Eric Mar Marcus, who's done amazing interviews with a lot of the early people, including Barbara Giddings, and the Library of Congress was just in, the Library of Congress was just interviewing people that were in World War II. It just so happened that you know I was looking for Alan Bernstein. I saw oh someone named Alan Bernstein happened to be interviewed by the Library of Congress talking about their World War II. So I started listening to it, and I'm like, oh, my God, this person is gay. <laughs> Maybe this is the Alan Bernstein that I was I was looking for. So other people had, had done them. I actually talked and met with Barbara Giddings before she died, uh, but never about this, this stuff. Uh, and I wish I had time and funding to talk to the people that are left. My conversation with John Cunningham this week should have been recorded. Uh, I apologize to John for, for, for not. I mostly was trying to get him to confirm whether I was getting the story right or not uh, here. And in the mean, and as I talked to him, found out about so many other amazing things that I didn't know about. So oral histories are important. Uh, and I thank every historian who's collected them. And there have been a lot of people working on gay history that have collected stuff saying, I don't know why this is important today, but it might be important sometime in the future. Thank you. Um, so here's a, what I would call a reflexive question. Uh, when did you realize, Dr. Sell, that you were a part of creating gay history? When people started interviewing me, when I, when I became the subject uh, of, when, when I, people started, grad students started interviewing me, and one of the interesting things, you know, as, as a researcher, some of the things, things a lot about research, uh, students started coming to me and asking me, and, you know, I do research and I know about human subjects and I know about protecting human subjects. I know the importance of it and I can talk about, I could give two hour talking about how gay people, uh, the terrible things that happened to gay people through research. So I understand the importance of human subjects and, and boards. However, most boards are overprotective and people would come to me and say, I'm, I, you know, I want to interview you. I'll protect your anonymity. No one will know it was you. And I've said numerous times to people, no, everyone will know it's me. <laughs> you have to know this is me. These are my words. And so go back to your, you know, stupid human subjects committee and tell them that you're not going to keep me in the closet. Uh, so that's been one of the, you know, insights that I've had about research and how we conduct it and, and when are we protecting so I thought a lot about when are we protecting subjects? Because when you back, look back at queer people, there's a lot of documents that were collected in ways in medical settings, for example. And you think, you know, this is disclosing medical stuff. This is important. Would this person appreciate that 60 years later I'm telling their story or am I invading their privacy? So it's, uh, but the question was about, was about me. Uh, so... Next question, sorry. Sorry, I thank rambled. You. No, no, not at all. Um, another individual writes in, thank you very much for this important and very informative talk about an often, too often overlooked aspect of our history. You noted the value of library and archival collections, particularly the proactive collecting of materials without immediate use based on the possibility of future research value. How often in your historical research have you encountered examples of librarians and archivists recognizing this potential value in materials that they might find personally objectionable? That they might find personally objectionable. I, I know that I was just about to give you examples that I don't think they knew the importance of. There's a lot of people that were collecting stuff during COVID, uh, uh, you know, that they didn't know what's the importance, but they, they thought this 
probably will be important someday. Let me keep this and someone might be able to use it. So they were talking about how queer people experienced COVID, but stuff that would be objectionable. I think that's that's collected all the time. I hope I hope it is at least. For example, I've donated a lot of my stuff. I went to the University of Pennsylvania. I started with other people. The grad group there was the, an undergrad group undergrad there and acted in a lot of things. And I collected signs that were put up. Our group was LGAP, Lesbians and Gays at Penn. And someone put up a sign LGAP and they did cross with that AIDS. You know, the A they used for AIDS and um, and other signs. And I I tore those down and uh, I, remember, I remember someone back when I was an undergrad saying to me, you should keep this stuff. I, it's like, I don't know who, who the type of person is that thinks of that. But um, I have our meetings from our first meeting and all the phone numbers of everyone that from the first meetings of some of that stuff. But objectionable, I hope and and know that and talk to our archivists, like the people that I work at the, um, you know, one of my favorite places I'll mention again, because I said it so quickly before, the New York City LGBT Community Centers National History Archives, and I love it because it's a community archives. They're trying to collect the stories of individuals, particularly in New York City, individuals and organizations. And those organizations have had lots of stuff. Um, I don't know if you, that's what you meant by objectionable. Objectionable can mean so many things. Of course, certainly. Um, we have time for one or maybe two more questions. Um, what's next for you in your research? Uh, what aspects do you plan to explore further, and might you have any book in mind? Um, I I don't know what's next. If any, if if there's any publishers out there, um, I I have thought about publishing this. I've been waiting, but like most things, I'm always waiting for someone else to write the book for me to to read. Uh, uh, this stuff, as you can see, I love, and. I definitely, I've been, you can't see um, on the shelves next to me, but on the shelves next to me uh, is a huge collection of stuff uh, that I would love to use uh, for the production of a book. Particularly, I'm interested in survey instruments. I love, you know, there was a lot of queer people doing surveys in the 60s, pre-Stonewall even. Uh, the, the, the Ladder and Mattachine, uh, uh, the Society for Individual Responsibility were sending out survey instruments and collecting data. And I love how the gay community was doing research on themselves and trying to produce information that was telling their stories rather than having stories told about them. And so that's what fascinates me. Uh, so one final question. Um, what aspects or aspect, aspect or aspects of the stories that you have shared or those perhaps you've not shared do you wish you could investigate further particularly? Are there particular aspects of the stories that you would like to know more about that you, you want to focus on in your next research steps, ideally if the sources allow? I want someone else, someone listening, please. Where's the rest of the riddle of the underworld? Where's the fourth book, Susa? So if you look at people that write about the history of you know queer people in the 1890s through uh, 2020. There's a lot more stuff out it now, but you know it's it's been growing and growing. But for a long time, there was no reliance. I I think on on those documents. Those documents have been really important. The documents that we know of, the 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 first two books, the the uh, autobiography, the autobiography, and the female impersonators books, and now the book in the the chapters in the National Library of Medicine. This person, if you know this person, this person was obsessive with with writing and publishing and getting their stuff published, unless there was a fire or something, uh, this stuff has to be laying somewhere. Please find, please find it and give it to me or just show it to me. Fair enough. Yeah, it's very important. Um, those, when, when anyone can identify things that they know are historically significant or they believe are historically significant or that through a conversation with ex experts like you can glean that they're historically significant to be able to preserve those things is so is so important. Uh, okay, one final question. Uh, uh, an individual writes in, thanks so much for this talk. Uh, I always enjoy hearing your perspective and your insights. What would you say is the biggest lesson 
from queer organizing history and documenting that we can hold on to in these current times. Queer organizing history and documentation. I don't think this is the answer. I, 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 I don't think this is the answer to your question, but this is what I'm going to say: is is that librarians and libraries have been integral, uh, and queer librarians have been integral to this process since the beginning. There was you can read about queer librarians from the beginning of libraries and the way information was preserved and you know when people wanted something removed how they they protected it uh, and so my heart because my favorite people in the world are librarians um, uh, maybe second is historians but I, I love librarians and, and archivists and the, the work they do but so many of them are openly queer and have been for a century. And I don't know what that connection is, but uh, it's special and I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Sell. And uh, I'm gonna state the obvious, which deserves to be stated. We appreciate you and your uh, research and you're taking time this afternoon to prepare and, and present this talk. And personally, again, thank you for our dialogue in advance. It's been a pleasure uh, getting to know you. I look forward to keeping in touch. and. Uh, on behalf of the National Library of Medicine and everyone watching, I uh, wish you all the best in your future work and look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you so much again, very much. Thank you. So uh, following that wonderful talk by Dr. Sell of Drexel University, it's my privilege to mention uh, that our next NLM history talk is going to be held on Thursday, September 21st. Uh, it's going to be the seventh annual Michael E. DeBakey Lecture in the History of Medicine. Joining us on September 21st is uh, Dr. Kelly O'Donnell, visiting assistant professor of U.S. History at Bryn Mawr College. She is also a 2019 NLM De Michael DeBakey Fellow. She's going to be speaking on Mrs. Medicine, Doctors' Wives, and the Making of Modern American Healthcare. So until September 21st, uh, when I hope you'll join us then, uh, wishing everyone uh, well a healthy uh, and peaceful summer. And uh, thank you again for tuning in today. And thanks again uh, from all of us to Dr. Sell for a wonderful presentation this afternoon. Take care. Thanks again. Bye, everybody.